I'm David Bradford. I'm the project director of Burj Khalifa for Turner International Middle East, who are the project managers. Turner, Turner International is the division of Turner Construction Company of New York. I'm standing in today for Fred Dury, who has been called away at short notice to start a major project in Kurdistan, which I understand includes two very tall buildings. I started work on Burj Khalifa in 2003, and I was greatly involved with the SOM team, who are, many of them are here today, I see. And I'm still involved, nearly 10 years later, in settling up the final contractor's claims and some additional work, such as the fit-out of the pool annex building and converting level 160 to the world's highest mosque. Level 160 was previously the this, this space allowed for a tuned mass damper, but it was found that it wasn't actually required. I will talk today about the reasons for building the world's tallest building, the challenges during construction, transition from construction to facilities management, and lastly, new projects that are occurring within the development. Uh, Burj Khalifa is MR Properties' most prestigious development out of over 100 developments in Dubai, including Dubai Marina, Arabian Ranches, The Greens, etc., etc. Burj Khalifa is the world's tallest integrated vertical city and the focal point of the downtown Dubai development. Why build a tall building? It's an efficient use of land with po population ever increasing. We obviously can't build on agricultural land, and we shouldn't be. Uh, it's a centerpiece for a bigger surrounding development, in this case, downtown Dubai, which when completed will have cost $20 billion. It increases land values in the vicinity of the tower. You have superior views from the tower, of course. And you have the prestige associated with a tall building, both for the owner and for the surrounding community and for the, and for the country. The decision to construct the most prestigious square kilometer of real estate in, on earth was made in 2002. And design work started in 2002 uh, with SOM being the principal consultant. Construction work started in 2003, and the building opened on the 4th of January, 2010. This is a, a photograph of the, of the actual construction site in 2003. The, the lake you see in the foreground there is actually, um, is to hold a groundwater discharge from the 120 numbers of deep wells that were required to dewater the site. The, the water table is quite high here in, in this site. It's only two meters down from the original surface. Um, eventually, we're allowed to connect the, the groundwater discharge into uh, the stormwater main on Doha Road, which you see up on the right there. It's over here. Um, but as, as an interim measure, we had to pump into this lake. Uh, there was an extensive soil investigation uh, program that was put in place in, in 2003, which is when I started the project, and I was deeply involved in, in that. Um, excavation dewatering uh, commenced in, in late uh, in 2003, and we actually excavated the whole site out down to the, filing, the final piling platform levels. Uh, we installed seven test piles from the final piling platform level and all gave such excellent results that we were able to reduce the pile length from the originally estimated 51 meters to 49 meters to 49 and a half meters. And I can recommend uh, if you have to do test piles, if, if, if you have the opportunity to excavate down to the final uh, piling platform level, you get very accurate results doing that. Otherwise, you're faced with trying to pile from the original level using double sleeves and the results often are not very accurate. <clears throat> we used two techniques um, during piling here that I discussed with the piling contractors. One was to use polymer drilling fluid instead of bentonite. You may be aware bentonite forms a cake on the, on the borehole walls and prevents good adhesion. If you use polymer that doesn't occur and you get a very good uh, adhesion between the concrete and, and <clears throat> in the pile and the surrounding soil. We also use welded reinforcing cages. And the reason for that was that when you drop the cage down into the borehole, the, the helical stirrups are often displaced. If you've ever pulled up a pile cage after you've dropped into a hole, you'll know what I mean. You'll find, 
A lot of disturbances have actually ridden up. So we actually welded the cages uh, to, the, to the main uh, bars in the, in the pile cage. And you can see, I'll just show you here. We actually got a little setup here where we have four workshops set up to, to weld, the, uh, weld the cages together. So we had 196 piles uh, supporting the tower, uh, 1.5 meters in diameter, and approximately 49 to 49 and a half meters deep. And for the podium, which is largely supporting the parking area, we had 860 piles, 90 centimeters in diameter, and 35 meters deep. We had strict supervision throughout the piling operation, and I took a very great personal interest in this myself, which resulted in not a single pile failure out of all the piles we tested. This is the uh, position of the tower on, on June 2006. By this time, we'd hit a, a three-day cycle in the construction using a jump form system. Um, three days is the best you can, you can do with concrete construction. I've, I looked at this in great detail to try and get it down to two and a half and two, which is, in my opinion, it can't be done. Um, three days is a, is a, is a, great, uh, a great achievement. You can see the tower cranes up on top of the building there. We had three, uh, Faf sorry, let me go back. We had three Fafco uh, diesel tower cranes up on the top of the building, which are up here. And this is the jump form system, of course, here. Um, now, you can also see concurrently with the Burge construction, where we're building the Dubai Mall, which is over here, the biggest mall in the world. Uh, this is Emar Square uh, being developed. and. The bottom left-hand corner here are the residences, which are seven towers. Uh, they were started uh, before the Burj, and they were finished in 2007. And the reason we did all this, or Emo did all this development, was to create a critical mass ready for the completion of Burj Khalifa. You heard Anthony Woods talking about the problems of building tall buildings uh, by themselves. Well, Imar had a very good scheme where the Burj Khalifa was the, was the center point of a, of a much larger development. Um, it was all built simultaneously, so when the Burj Khalifa was completed, there were a lot of buildings already completed around the Burj Khalifa. So when the, uh, when the Burj Khalifa was opened in early January 2010, we already had completed the Dubai Mall, the biggest mall in the world. We had five hotels finished eight office buildings, the boulevard, the world's largest performing fountain, and 6,000 residential units. And this was in addition to 25,000 residential units built by EMA <clears throat> elsewhere in Dubai. This is all due to the inspiration and, and passion of the chairman of EMA Properties, Mr. Mohammed Alabar. Sorry, this is the completed uh, complex uh, you can see Burj Khalifa there. The mall is, uh, this is the fountain I'm in here. Uh, and the mall is, what, this is one of the, 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 one of the address hotels, and the mall is in here. So we can see when, when the Burj Khalifa was finished, all of this, this critical mass was already finished also, which meant we had a lot of people living, living in the area. We had a lot of visitors coming to the mall. And um, Burj Khalifa was, was the center point of this whole development. This is uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who was the ruler of Dubai. Um, His Highness is very dynamic. Anybody who's ever visited Dubai or worked in Dubai will know Sheikh Mohammed is, is, the, is the real power behind the development of Dubai. He pushes everything. Um, it's one of the reasons Dubai is so very efficient and, 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 and so developed. And it was uh, Sheikh Mohammed and Mohammed al Abar who were the inspiration behind the development of Burj Khalifa way back in 2002. So the Sheikh Mohammed was present at the first pour uh, of the concrete draft slab we had in 2004 and actually inaugurated Burj Khalifa on the 4th of January. When he was shown the early concepts in 2002 of 550 meters, he asked Imar, why, why is it so small? Why are you stopping at 550 meters? Build bigger. So the challenge was taken up by Mohammed al Abar, who guided the whole team to turn the master plan into reality. 
This is a, the master plan of the, of the uh, downtown, downtown Dubai area. This is the tower here, of course, the three, three wings. This is the, the mall over here. Uh, this is the, the lake. And these are all the residential units. This is all low rise over here. This is all, you know, three to six floors. Um, it was called uh, Old Town, Old Town, part of downtown. And it was meant to simulate the old Bestekia uh, area in Dubai, the old souk. So it was, it was a complete mix of, of buildings of different, uh, different heights and different types. And the plan was that tall buildings shouldn't stand alone. They must be part of a greater scheme of the city. And the tall buildings to create an urban context rather than being inserted into one. So the master plan was developed with Burj Khalifa as being the focal point of downtown Dubai. So it wasn't developed in insulation, in isolation, sorry. Uh, Imar Properties invested $20 billion in the, the one kilometer square, one, one kilometer square site, mixed use site. The whole site here is one, is one square kilometer. Um, from 2005 to 2008, we have 45,000 workmen on the site, out of which 12,000 worked on Burj Khalifa. We had 100 tower cranes on this one site alone. The, the logistics of this whole development were, of course, of, extremely complex. You can imagine trying to get 45,000 men <laughs> into the site in the morning, getting them home in the evening. So that was all handled by Turner. Uh, we were actually the project managers, not only on Burj Khalifa, but on the mall and for, for the whole infrastructure. This slide is, is how the height of Burj Khalifa developed. You'll find this section of the presentation very confusing. And it was certainly very confusing for the construction team when we were trying to build the building, the, the height was going up and down like a yo-yo for, for many months. So the original brief given to SOM in 2002 was 550 meters. Um, SOM won the competition based on that height. By July 2003, the height had crept up to 593 meters. And then in October 2003, it had reached 714 meters. When we awarded the main contract to Samsung in, two, in early 2004, the height was set at 750 meters. Um, during this time, Adrian Smith, the principal architect with SOM, was campaigning to have the tower made even higher because he thought the, the spire in the original designs, the top of the spire was too truncated. and He, would, he, would, he wanted to have a nice slender spire. Um, and he advocated 808 meters, but that, that actually didn't happen. It stayed in 750 meters for quite some time. In October 2007, we had a workshop on the spire fabrication erection, and we found that the costs were quite astronomical, actually, to, to build a spire to <clears throat> 800 meters. So the height was reduced to 728 meters. So when Imar conveyed this message to Sheikh Mohammed, he, was not a, he wasn't a happy camper at all. And he told Imar, no way, Jose, it's going to stay at... Uh, the previous height of um, 808 meters or even increase it. So it was then increased to 818 meters, eight of course being an auspicious number. And it stayed at 818 until the, the end of the job. Of course, during this time, the construction was going, going apace. We had the foundations already built. The structure was already 30% up. So we all wondered, you know, can the, can the foundation support this additional weight? So Bill Baker and his team did a, <coughs> a great job in looking at that and confirming Yes, indeed, the foundations can support this additional weight. This is 100 years of evolution of the tallest buildings of the world. The previous buildings were all mainly office buildings, uh, as you know. Um, and the, the, world, the world record was in, in, increased in, incrementally, you know, maybe 10 or 15 meters every time. When Burj Khalifa came along, of course, there was a quantum leap in height. We went from Taipei 101 at uh, 508 meters up to 828 meters, which was the eventual height of the, height of the Burj Dubai. Uh, the, the Burj Khalifa, of course, is a, is a mixed-use development. As you can see here, it has a hotel in the bottom. Um, Amani residences, uh, sky lobbies that include uh, swimming pools and other facilities for the tenants. We have corporate suites 
Atmosphere Restaurant at 122, the Observatory 124, Corporate Suites at 125 to 154, and Communications and Broadcasting, the top of the tower. Um, we have three dedicated ac accesses to the three different areas of the building. This is the entrance to the Amani Hotel, which uh, takes up the levels uh, one through eight and 38 and 39, and also feeds the service residences at areas uh, nine, uh, floors nine to 16. Have 160 guest rooms, 144 service departments, five restaurants, a ballroom, nightclub, spa, day lounge, gentlemen's lounge, business center, and Armani retail. This is the residential lobby, which gives access to 920 residential units. Uh, Sky Lobby is at 43 and 76. And the Sky Lobby, as I just mentioned, contain fitness centers, indoor, outdoor swimming pools, jacuzzis, and recreation rooms. You might be wondering what all these poles are, like bamboo poles out in the lobby there. Well, they're not bamboo, they're actually stainless steel. And uh, the, the gold colored uh, Dishes are actually gold-plated symbols. This is artwork by Plensker of Spain. And what it is, there are water jets up in the ceiling, which, which are up here. And the water jets drop on a, on a timer and fall onto some of the symbols, creating a, a noise. So you get this bing, bing, bong, bong effect. And you can play different tunes with this system. And because the, the atrium here, as you can see, is all very hard finishes, stainless steel and marble, it, it creates a very loud, uh, very loud noise. It's very pleasing when you come into the lobby. <clears throat> this is the entrance to the, to the office uh, suites. Again, beautiful finishes. This, the wood ceiling up here was made by uh, Imperial Woodwork of Chicago. Um, now, the, the Council of Tall Buildings changed the rules for, for building height to be measured in, uh, I think, 2010. And they said that the, the building height has to be measured from the lowest significant open air pedestrian entrance. So previously we'd been measuring from the residential entrance, which gave us a height of 818 meters. But when the new ruling came out, we, we could take the reading from, from the B1 level, which was the drop off for, for these uh, corporate suites. And that gave us a height, the finished height of the building is 828 meters. So the corporate suites are at levels 112 to 151, a total gross area of 37,000 square meters. So uh, design challenges, um, we'll go into this in detail in the following slides. This flower you see here is, the, is a hymenocallus, which is, grows out <clears throat> in the desert in Dubai when there's, when there's a rain. Fortunately, we haven't had rain for the last three years. So there hasn't been any flowers growing, anything at all growing out in the desert. Um, anyway, this was the inspiration for Adrian Smith to develop his design. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side here the, the Arabic uh, architecture also. So the design has um, followed patterning systems from Islamic architecture. So the tower designed in three petals around the center core. If the tower rises, the petals set back and up an anti-clockwise spiraling pattern, which minimizes wind forces on the building. So, so this is aerodynamic shaping. So the design team carried out detailed climatic and wind studies. Um, and we engaged RWDI of Toronto to carry out extensive wind tunnel testing. The wind data that we had when, we're, when we started this exercise was, was, was very limited, and it was largely based on a wind gauge at Dubai Airport that was at 10 meters height, plus some data from weather balloons in Abu Dhabi. So we had to extrapolate that information to projected wind speeds way up the tower at 828 meters, which was quite a task. But when the tower was finished, we actually measured, physically measured the wind speed and the RWDI predictions were found to be very accurate. There was a space at level 160 for a tune mass damper, which we found during testing wasn't required, so that was just an empty space and it's now converted into a mosque. And we also thought we need a chain damper up in the, the spire pipe, but again, that was found not to be required. So we have no damping at all in the building. Uh, this is gravity load management. I think this has been covered previously by, by SOM, so I'll just, I'll just skip through this. I'm running out of time. Um, this is fire and life safety. The, the green areas you see there are areas of refuge. 
that were developed uh, for the Burj Khalifa. Other advantages, we have lifeboat elevators, five lifeboat elevators which are meant to be used for a controlled evacuation of, of, of people in the building. Uh, we have fire protection water tanks up in the building, so the sprinkler system works by gravity. We don't depend on pumps. There's uh, floor smoke management, and the concrete structure encloses the staircase walls. So we've got 250 millimeter reinforced concrete walls around all the escape staircases. This is the cladding. The cladding installation here was outstanding. In my opinion, it's a benchmark. It's a world benchmark for design installation of cladding. If, any, if you ever go to Dubai, please take a look at the cladding. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, the cladding had a checkered history. <clears throat> we started out with Schmidlin and the joint venture, Schmidlin and Arabian Aluminium. Schmidlin went broke after nine months. And Arabian Aluminium kindly took up the challenge and they joint ventured with Far East Aluminium of Hong Kong. So this was the first uh, test in, in, in China. Uh, the Smidlin tests all failed. In fact, we did tests in Bangkok, in, in Dubai, and they all leaked water all over the place. So this was the test done in China, past first time. Beautiful, no, no leaks at all. So then, the <clears throat> after two months, the first panels were installed on the site. Uh, by the end of December 2008, the cladding was substantially complete. And out of 26,000 panels installed on the site, only 30 panels were ejected, which shows the kind of quality control we had on this. Um, environmental, um, we've got a few environmental <coughs> items built in the building. We have uh, the condensate water from the air conditioning system is used for irrigation. Uh, we've got energy wheels, reflective glazing. These are solar panels on the roof of the office annex building that supply much of the hot water. We weren't, unfortunately, able to get up to the minimum criteria for L LED, but we are now following the Dubai municipality guidelines for green building criteria. Uh, this is the interior of one of the residences. Um, all of these finishes were approved by the chairman. He's very particular about approving everything, so every finish in the building was personally inspected by Mohammed al Abar and approved. Um, we did mock-ups for all the apartments, for the three elevators, hotel rooms, corridors, carpets, etc., etc. In fact, uh, when I took the chairman to see the first mock-ups of the apartments, he didn't really like them. And he engaged SOM and a company called EDS from Los Angeles to, to redesign the apartments and upgrade the finishes. So we had to actually change a lot of the partitions around um, and upgrade the finishes, which caused a bit of a hiccup in the construction program. That's the kind of detail that Mohammed al -Abar likes. He likes to get into, into the detail and give the best possible uh, result. Uh, these are the, f the finishes in a typical residential lobby. It's all marble on the floor. And there's exotic woods on the, on the walls and ceiling. This is artwork. We've got a thousand pieces of artwork in the building, all personally approved by Mohammed al -Abar. This is the building monitoring system that was kindly installed free of charge by Samsung. Thank you very much, Samsung, on level 139. So Samsung have got this, all this, these monitors wired back to their uh, office in, in, in Seoul, Korea. So they're measuring the acceleration displacement of the tower, and it's constantly monitored. To, and the response to earthquakes, to, sorry, the response to high winds and earthquakes in Iran and Pakistan has been as predicted. In fact, in September 2008, we had a very unusual um, occasion when a small earthquake occurred in Mesafi, which is in the neighboring emirate, and the monitoring equipment re recorded a maximum building acceleration of 3.82 millijs and a maximum horizontal displacement of 2.5 centimeters. This information, of course, is invaluable in in the design of, of new mega buildings. This is the landscaping. It was completely changed, in fact. We had the landscaping finished in July 2007, the design. Mohammed al Abar didn't like it. He thought it didn't continue the building uh, design out into the landscaping. So he hired a new consultant uh, to work together with SOM, and this is the result of the new design. Uh, these are the fountains. We hired wet design also to, to uh, design the fountains. This is the entrance to Burj Khalifa and also fountains in front of the main, <coughs> the main entrances. This is the Dubai Mall, the biggest mall in the world, uh, with Burj Khalifa in the background there. You can see this, the mall was finished two years before we finished Burj Khalifa. They've got a footfall of 54 million visitors uh, last year, 2011, and it's now being expanded. There's so much demand for retail space. Uh, these are the address hotels. We built two address hotels on the, on the downtown Dubai development. 
So all in all, we had five hotels built on, built on the development with a thousand rooms and a thousand service departments. Uh, this, this shows the uh, downtown Dubai, uh, what we call uh, the old town. You can see that the shape of the buildings here, it mirrors uh, old um, Arabic architecture, all low-rise low buildings, uh, two, two to six stories. This is what we call Boulevard Plaza. These two buildings and the buildings behind them constitute Imar Square. These are office buildings. This is Dubai Fountain. It's the world's biggest operating fountain. Um, down at the bottom there. And this, this is really a big attraction to visitors to Dubai. They go down there free of charge, take their families down, watch the fountain go off at night. And, and it's really, really an excellent show. This is the, the Boulevard Plaza. Sorry, this, yeah, this is the boulevard. Um, the boulevard is 75 meters wide with dual, uh, dual three-lane roads and a 22-meter wide um, sidewalk either side of the road. Um, this was designed after the EMAR team visited various cities in the world, including Paris, Barcelona, New York, London, and Chicago, um, to develop a, a really nice boulevard where people can walk. And there's all palm trees planted down the boulevard there, and it's still under development. There's no uh, parking allowed on the boulevard. All the parking is underground. There's a massive underground car parks there with space for 3,600 cars. <clears throat> this is the opening ceremony in 2010, 4th of January 2010. Uh, this gentleman, I don't know if you know him, is called Spider-Man. Uh, it's Alain Robert, a Frenchman, and he's, his role in life is to cli climb high-rise buildings. So he applied for, for permission to climb Burj Khalifa. It was given, but the caveat was he had to wear a rope. You can't see a rope here, but there's a rope that goes up to the top of the building, and he climbed from the bottom up to the terrace. And then he would take a rest and go on. It took him six hours to climb to the top, and he actually climbed to the very top, 828 meters. This gentleman you probably know from the movies. This is Tom Cruise, of course, sitting in a very dangerous position there. He's actually got a harness on. You can't see it's... He actually climbed up the pipe and came out on the top. Um, and they filmed Mis uh, Mission Impossible 4 there uh, on the Burj Khalifa. So these are the, the records. Um, tallest building, tallest man-made structure, tallest freestanding structure, largest number of stories, highest occupied floor, 160. Highest outdoor observation deck, world record vertical concrete pumping, 448 meters. Uh, tallest service elevator, highest installation of aluminium, highest swimming pool at level 76. Um, okay. So the Burj effect. Uh, previously to the Burj Khalifa, all the, the world's highest buildings were mainly office buildings. Um, but the Burj Khalifa changed that concept into, the, into the, the world's tallest integrated vertical city. So the success of uh, downtown Dubai has changed the economics of mega tall buildings. Uh, rental rates for the surrounding apartments in the Dubai development increased 13% within two months of the opening of the Burj Khalifa. And there's a great demand for all real estate in the area now. So the, uh, the conclusion is, um, Imar doesn't rest on its laurels. Uh, Chairman Mohammed al Abar's a uh, very dynamic character. So in, in the works, in the development, we have, this is a new opera house. It's uh, under design right now. We have, this is a travel, the world's biggest travel aid. Dubai's got to have the biggest everything. So this is the world's biggest travel aid, <laughs> 850 meters. And it takes passengers from the metro station, which is off to the left there, around the front, in, directly into the Dubai Mall. So they're anticipating this will in increase footfall in the mall by, by a larger degree. So just to conclude, Burj Khalifa is an iconic landmark created by the passion, ambition, leadership of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed and Imar's Chairman Mohammed al -Abar. It was a privilege to be involved in the design and particularly the construction, which was my forte, of the Burj Khalifa. There was a hundred different nationalities came together with a thoroughly professional, dedicated team of consultants and contractors to deliver the world's tallest integrated vertical city. Thank you.